Hi, my name is Sarah Guthels and I lead DevRel here at Sentry, and this is the next video in the Debugging Your Next.js Project with Sentry. In this video, we're going to go over how to create a new Sentry project, get your Next.js project set up with Sentry, and see it working. If you'd like to follow along, there's a couple things you need first. One is a Next.js project. If you don't have one handy, we actually open sourced this flashcard app that is built with Next.js and available on GitHub for free. Feel free to clone this project and use it as your sample application. In addition to this project, you will need a database. In this example, we used a planet scale database, so you can use that one if you'd like. If you'd like to use something else, that's totally fine, uh, but you just need to figure out how to connect that database to this Sentry application. The last thing you'll need is a Sentry account. So if you haven't already, sign up for Sentry. All of the links for this GitHub repository and signing up for Sentry are down in the description below. I've already cloned the flashcard repository on my local machine. I'll be using Visual Studio Code, VS Code, for this demo. And I specifically have the No Sentry branch checked out. The main branch on our flashcards repository is deployed to Vercel, so that one is a working version. We have the No Sentry branch for myself and you to use if you want to try out setting up Sentry for the first time with a Next.js example application. Before we go any further, I will create a Sentry project that will monitor this Next.js application. What I've done is opened a browser, gone to Sentry.io, and logged in. Then I clicked Create Project, and I was presented with this screen. Sentry can support over 100 languages and frameworks, and uh, we have a couple of specific ways that we set up projects for some of those frameworks. And of course, Next.js is one of them. So I'll click Next.js for my framework of choice. We're gonna say alert me for every new issue, just leave it as the default. And we're going to rename this to be um, debugging Next.js projects. And it'll be part of my Sentry DevRel team. Let's go ahead and click on Create Project, and we'll be presented with these install instructions. One nice thing about Next.js projects with Sentry is we have a command line interface wizard, a CLI wizard, that you can use to set up and install Sentry in your application. It's just this one line of code right here. You can actually find that on our docs as well. These are our Next.js docs. And if you scroll down, that single line of code to start the wizard appears right here on the install instructions. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and I'm gonna head over to my Visual Studio Code terminal and I'm going to paste that in and start the wizard. As a reminder, Sentry is open source, and so you can self-host and use Sentry completely free if you'd like to. In this case, though, I am using the Sentry SaaS application. I do have a Sentry account. When I choose yes to having a Sentry account, a new window opens up in my browser, allowing the wizard to connect to my Sentry account where I'm logged in on my browser already. I can click on view issues or see docs, or I can just close this browser window altogether. Now that we connected the wizard to my Sentry account, I'm gonna choose the project that we just created, debugging Next.js projects. And using PNPM, the Sentry wizard installs all of the dependencies we need for a Next.js project. You can see that some of our config files have been updated as well as three new files have been created, our client config, edge config, and server config for Sentry. If you're setting up a Sentry project on a brand new repository, you might want to have a sample web page to test this out on. In this case, we don't need to do that because we actually have a fully functional Next.js application that we're going to use. So I'm going to check no. We also have some specific support for CI CD tools. In this case, we're not using any, so I'm going to say no. And we've successfully installed the Sentry Next.js SDK to our Next.js application repository. Before we get started with anything else, let's actually make sure that this application builds and runs. So I'm going to go ahead and run pnpm build. And with everything successfully building, we're going to run pnpm start. We can find the application running at localhost 3000, and we can sign in with the super secure admin at admin.com with password admin. 
Don't worry if you forget that, it's in the README. So this is our flashcard application. It's fairly simple. You can manage your flashcards. These are different flashcards that we have. Um, and when you click on one, it'll have a question, an answer, and a category. You can also change up different categories if you'd like and create new ones. You can also practice your flashcards. Uh, we can go into the JavaScript category and define what a closure is, check to see if we got it right, and move on to the next one. Fairly simple. So why don't we go ahead and try to trigger an error because this application is fairly simple and does actually work. So we need to put in an error to actually see it happening in Sentry. The error I'm gonna introduce is the one that checks to make sure that there is a question and answer each of length greater than zero before we save any changes to a updated flashcard. We can find this logic under pages, manage, flashcards in the slug TypeScript file. So we'll scroll down over here to line, I think it's 113. This is where we are handling any kind of update to a flashcard. And I'm just going to comment out this line right here, and I'm going to say we're not going to check to validate that the length of the question is more than zero. Now that we've made that update, I'm going to go ahead and build and rerun. And now that it's running, I'm going to head back over. And before we do anything else, I'm going to open up the JavaScript console within the browser just so that we can see if there's any useful information there as well. We're going to head over to manage and just click on this very first question or flashcard and remove the question and attempt to update. All right. We're getting an error. We're getting this spinning wheel here. And what we should have gotten was saying, hey, you can't update without filling out this field since it is a required field. The error that we get over here is um, a bad request on put on what is the closure, not getting a ton of information here, a uh, bad reason or failed to update flashcard reason, bad request in update, but again, not really a ton of useful information. Um, uh, maybe if you knew what the uh, application, like how it was built and exactly where this was, then this would be enough information for you. Uh, but it wouldn't be that useful if you weren't in your user's browser. So let's go ahead and go over to Sentry and see what Sentry has to, see, to show us. We're going to head back over to Sentry and we're going to go back into the issues for this project. And we can see here that the error, uh, which is the same error that we had over in the JavaScript console, also shows up here in Sentry. We get a failed to update flashcard, reason, bad request. It's an unhandled exception and it was a minute ago. So let's go ahead and click into this. So this is an issues page on Sentry, and what we get a lot of information here that I really want to call out. So first of all, we get some general information about the person and the machine that they were using that triggered the error. Uh, in this case, we were running it on localhost, so we don't really have a true IP address to reference. Uh, we can see that I'm on a Mac. We can see that I'm using Chrome as my browser. Uh, we can see what the URL was, in particular, it was on localhost, um, but it's specifically for this what is a closure uh, flashcard. We can see what release we're on for our application, and we can get other information such as what environment we're in. We are pretending we're in a production level environment. We didn't change that development. So um, it's assuming we're in production, whether it was handled and what kind of level this is. Is this just a warning, an error, et cetera? Below here, you'll get information about the stack trace. So we can see that in the flashcards.ts file is where this error was thrown. We actually made the change over in the slug TypeScript file, but of course that's not where the error is triggered. Uh, this is just where the error kind of originates from. I'm gonna skip over session replay because that's something that Lazar will talk about later on in the video series. 
And we're going to come down here to our breadcrumbs where we can see some additional information about what happened. So we can see that the error was actually triggered on a put for the what is closure flashcard. That's when the error was triggered. You can see that they happened at the same timestamp. And prior to that, we can actually see that the submit button was pressed. We can see that uh, an input field was clicked into. And we can also see that we went to the manage flashcards and a specific flashcard, specifically what is a closure um, page. So we went over to that page, it fetched that information, um, we, it showed the page, it registered that transaction that that page was loaded. Uh, the user, meaning us, clicked into an input field, clicked the submit button, and when that happened, um, we tried to submit or, or send that information, put that information in the database, and, and that resulted in an error. As you continue to scroll down, you can see that additional information such as these headers and um, information about the user, browser, device, etc., are also down here. Uh, there might be additional information down here than there was up here at the very top. We try to keep the most relevant information here at the very top. A certain type of error may happen more than once, especially if you have a lot of users who are attempting to do the same types of things. So up here we can see how many times this uh, event happened that, or, or how many times this error was triggered in a unique event, as well as how many users it has impacted. This type of information might be relevant for you to prioritize what errors or performance regressions you need to fix. We can also hear, see here that it's not assigned to anyone and um, how many times this error has shown up in the last 24 hours, the last 30 days, when it was first seen, when it was most recently seen, um, which releases might have caused the error. We can add GitHub issue tracking to this issue and we have a, a bunch of additional tags which you might recognize are similarly listed up here at the top and down here um, in our further information on this issue. And that's the basics of starting a new Next.js project in Sentry, installing it into your Next.js application and running it and actually seeing that error pop up over in your Sentry dashboard.